when the organizers invited me to introduce this panel, I understood I had to speak 45 minutes. But I have just realized I have to speak four to five minutes. So I, I, will, I will adjust my, my speaking notes. Anyway, so welcome to uh, this session on central bank digital uh, currencies. I wish to warmly uh, thank the panelists, uh, Cecilia uh, Skingley on my right, Nea Nerula on my left, uh, Markus Brunermeyer, and last but not least, Ulrich uh, Binzail, uh, who was kind enough to accept a last minute invitation to a virtual participation due to the fact that John Canliffe uh, could not participate due to health uh, reasons. Our panelists are, uh, of course, uh, very well known to experts in the field of digital finance, but I will still briefly uh, introduce them. Marcus is uh, a professor at Princeton University. Cecilia is deputy governor uh, at the Swedish Central Bank. Nea is director of the Digital Currency Initiative of the MIT Media Lab. And Ulrich is director general for payments and market infrastructures at the European Central Bank. Uh, let me emphasize that this is a dream team for CBDC. Uh, this is a, a unique group of uh, experts, and I'm sure we will have an inspiring uh, session. Uh, my role here is only to say a few words to introduce uh, the topic, again, four to five minutes. The discussion on CBDCs uh, originates from uh, the digitalization of, of finance. Uh, digitalization is transforming um, the financial sector. Uh, bringing value added, but uh, in many cases, it is just used as a marketing tool to promote speculative instruments. As we now know, uh, cryptos, which are the case in point, cryptos initially prosper on the fear of missing out only to crash later. And the reasons now have become uh, clear. Cryptos are subject to hurt behavior. According to surveys, one third of crypto investors knows very little or even nothing about the assets they are buying. Also, cryptos are prone to bubbles. In uh, recent weeks, the two largest cryptos, Bitcoins and Ethereum, have lost most of their uh, value. Several stable coins have lost their peg and uh, some of them have even disappeared, literally disappeared. In some cases, literally, because the, the founder disappeared with the money. And, but the expansion of uh, cryptos has been, uh, for central banks, a, a wake-up call. It has made clear in the central banking community that if we do not satisfy the demand for digital innovation, others will. And if we do not provide the public sector anchor to digital payments, we may end up with uh, volatility, instability, and confusion about what is digital money and what is not digital money. It is therefore not surprising that today, 100, according to the BIS, 105 central banks uh, around the world, representing 95% of global GDP, are exploring CBDCs. So why are they doing this? Why are central banks increasingly involved in CBDC projects? My view is that by working on CBDCs, central banks uh, are simply responding to the evolution of societal needs. In fact, the increase in digital payments shows that people's demand for means of payment is rapidly adapting to the digital era. In some countries, the decline of cash is accelerating in a nonlinear way. Therefore, for a central bank, certainly for the ECB, the most compelling reason for issuing a CBDC is to ensure that public money, central bank money, remains widely accessible in the digital age, preserving its role as the anchor, the numerator of the payments system. Other objectives are, of course, uh, relevant. Uh, you know, discussions uh, uh, range from uh, the need to improve payment efficiency and security, to ensure financial stability, to improve financial inclusion, and address risks of large-scale adoption of private or foreign currencies. But even if we achieve these objectives, we cannot take the success of CBDCs for granted. To be a success, CBDCs must respond to the needs of people in their daily lives. 
offering an efficient, user-friendly, cheap, easy-to-use digital means of payment that people can use everywhere for their daily uh, payments. And CBDCs must, of course, be designed and introduced in a way that preserves the crucial role of private financial intermediation and stimulates private in, uh, innovation. So this is a daunting task, and I'm lucky enough that today uh, I don't have to, to answer the awkward question that you usually get when you start discussing this topic. Today I have the luxury that I can uh, ask questions and uh, my friends here uh, are supposed to answer. And we are lucky that we have a panel that can address the multiple facets of the digital transformation journey that central banks are embarking on. So if uh, the panelists agree, I would start, Cecilia, with you. No, no, you, you. So uh, a key question that many are raising, Cecilia, is that the impact of CBDCs on financial markets is unclear at best. How can a CBDC uh, be made attractive enough, but not so attractive that it crowds out uh, market players? Thank you, Fabio, and hello to you all. Um, so it's about finding the Goldilocks version of a, of a CBDC, really. Um, I think there are two uh, dimensions we have to consider here. CBDC, on one hand, as a payment service, and on the other hand, CBDC as a, as a money, because the crowding out challenges look quite different uh, in these two dimensions. Uh, and let me start with CBDC as a, as a money or, or even a store of value. So CBDC as money relates to the CBDC as a means of payment and store of value. Uh, and here, uh, CBDC competes with bank deposits. Uh, and look at what makes CBDC attractive as a store of value. Uh, we should focus on tools such as interest rates and caps. And these are the kind of tools that central banks are looking at to steer CBDC demand. Uh, and I think uh, the central banks actually have uh, the, uh, the tools um, that they can, they can use to make sure that CBDC in its money form does not come out private money. It was also interesting enough, um, the uh, conclusion in a report written by seven central banks that collaborate on these issues in a report that was published in September 2021. You can, uh, you can find them on the BIS webpage. And it has the governors of the Federal Reserve, the ECB, uh, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, etc., others, uh, underlining uh, the, uh, the agreement that central banks can handle um, making sure that CBDC is as money is, is attractive but not too attractive to society. Uh, now, the other aspect of this is CBDC as a means of payment. What really makes a CBDC attractive as a means of payment is to decide how liquid it is, how easy it is to uh, use it in the economy, uh, and how easy it can be transformed into desired goods and services. And here we are thinking about convertibility, how the network effects is, how easy it is for citizens to transform uh, CBDC into other forms of money. One important part of this is the legal aspect of a CBDC. Um, this is not a venture that central banks can do on their own, is my belief. Uh, money is, at the end of the day, very much a question of values, of social values. It needs a dialogue with the politicians, uh, and it needs a, a clear uh, legislation framework. And uh, the issue, is it going to be a legal tender or not? And if it is a legal tender, does it actually have any real content in these worlds, or is it just words? It's going to uh, mean a lot of difference whether CBDC works as a means of payments or not. And in this area, I think it's actually going to be a bit more difficult for central banks to sort of calibrate the, the uh, attractiveness using CBDCs as a, as a means of payment. Um, we have to think about the rule book uh, where uh, the CBDC is working from a platform uh, and how we decide on convertibility to other types of money through the, the design. Um, and in any case, 
there is a risk if a CBDC is very popular, could crowd out other payment services. This could be bad, but actually it could also be good. To my knowledge, all central banks, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on that, all central banks uh, that are considering a CBDC, so they are looking at a distribution model that uh, have intermediaries providing uh, the various payment services to the general public. And here as central banks, if we're thinking about designing such a platform, we face a trade-off. Uh, to what extent should we steer the design of these services? Uh, we want the private sector to uh, innovate, uh, and then they need to have the freedom to do so. But it also means that the central bank loses some control of the CBDC service, and uh, ultimately how attractive they will be. Uh, so, potentially, if we allow for a very open level of innovation, uh, one private sector innovation could, uh, at least in theory, crowd out other private services. But on the other hand, if we limit the freedom to innovate, we may end up with a very unattractive CBDC. So, finding this Goldilocks zone for the CBDC, where it's not too small and not too large, it's not easy. Uh, but I think it's not nothing, anything that really keeps me uh, awake at night. Uh, I think we cannot pin down all the uncertainties beforehand. Uh, we cannot control everything, and we are not, certainly not doing that already today, so we shouldn't expect that in the future. I think um, as we move along, and some countries are already considering, and some have actually already introduced, introduced them, I think the changes will be pretty gradual over time then therefore we will have time to react and I think there are pretty good tools in our toolbox to do so. Thank you very much, Cecilia. So it's a complex task, but we know how to handle it. At least we hope. Uh, let me now turn to Ulrich from Frankfurt. I hope, Ulrich, are you connected? Yes. Yeah, I can okay. hear you, yeah. Uh, good morning, Ulrich. Uh, how do you see the role of CBDC in achieving broader policy objectives such as competition, innovation, and inclusion. How relevant is the discussion on these topics in the Euro area and worldwide? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Fabio. Um, yeah, those are, I would say, important uh, objectives on top of the anchoring role of central bank money through CBDC in the digital age. And uh, let me first say some words on competition and innovation and then on inclusiveness, which is a bit uh, different. So for the ECB, the commitment to competition and innovation follows directly from the EU treaty. And uh, yeah, efficient and reliable means of payment are the very basis, one could say, of modern society. And uh, innovation and competition are key to achieve uh, efficiency. And um, one could say, you know, innovation has been impressive in electronic payments over the last uh, decades. Competition, not necessarily so, because uh, payments um, yeah, is a network function, which uh, leads uh, easily also to market concentration and then to possible abuse of uh, power by the leading providers. And I would see two implications of that uh, for CBDC. The first one is that uh, CBDC in itself, um, in a purely digital world, uh, helps as it is a competitor, which will limit the potential abuse of uh, market power by dominating private providers. So CBDC, you know, will be one fallback solution. And, uh, and that limits, you know, even, you know, the, the market share of the most dominant providers and people can fall back on CBDC and CBDC should be uh, cost-free for the digital euro that was set for the citizens which, uh, who use it. And uh, it can be, I would say, competitive and cheap because of the economies of scale that we can realize. And the second implication is that CBDC should be designed in a way to support the development of a surrounding innovative and competitive ecosystem. Cecilia has alluded to that. So distributors, acquirers, service providers of all kinds should be incentivized to support CBDC through a good business model that attracts them 
and that keeps uh, openness for entrance into those various services where innovation is uh, rewarded uh, by playing then an important role. I mean, if more generally on innovations, remarkably for banknotes, um, one could say that technology remained pretty stable for 350 years, not technology in terms of security features, but uh, for all the rest, this was quite stable, but that is unsinkable in the field of electronic payments. As we have observed it, it's a constantly evolving and still improving uh, field. And again, this speaks in favor of CBDC being embedded in a competitive ecosystem where the innovation will be brought through openness and competition of uh, service providers. So that you know, precludes a model where CBDC is a, you know, a completely separate uh, solution run by the central bank and then always you know, lagging behind the uh, market innovation. And just a few more words on inclusiveness, uh, if you allow. I mean, there are some areas in the world where the role of CBDC in that field is totally obvious. Namely, if you have a low shared of uh, a low share of banked people, but you know, people having uh, mobile phone, phones allowing for mobile payments of CBDC. Countries like uh, Nigeria can really, you know, their CBDC makes a huge difference for financial inclusion. But also for advanced economies like Europe, it's an important topic. I mean, inclusiveness has been part of our retail payment strategy uh, of the of the Commission as well. ECB has taken into account inclusiveness for banknote design ever since uh, the launch of the euro. And also the European legislator has made inclusiveness in payments, you know, important like through the bank account directive. So it's not a question that also the digital euro should aim at inclusiveness, in particular for the scenario where banknotes usage would be marginalized, not because we want that, but because society um, moves in that direction. And then CBDC must also, you know, fill the gap um, that uh, banknotes, you know, allowed in terms of inclusiveness. And, uh, and that, of course, you know, will cost some money. There's a need, you know, to think about the form factors, you know, what cards do you may want to provide smart cards to people? I mean, what customer support do you need to ensure inclusiveness? So, that has to be planned and in particular for the phase later on one day where indeed the use of cash has been marginalized to the extent that it no longer can play this role. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, let me now turn to you, Marcus. One of the most debated issues in relation to CBDCs, but uh, uh, more generally in relation to digital payments is privacy. So my question would be, how can we deal with the natural tension between the strong wish for privacy from the general public on the one hand and the public interest in maintaining the level of transparency required to combat illicit activities such as AML, uh, CFT, or any other? Thanks a lot, uh, Fabio, and thanks a lot to the ECB team for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so privacy is really one of the key issues. It's also very related to what Cecilia was talking about, whether you know, a CBDC will be successful or perhaps too successful, and you need a certain degree of privacy for people to accept uh, a CBDC. And, and money is about trust and is about coined freedom. So it's freedom, you can choose what you do and nobody can interfere with that. So privacy is really is very important. And if you think about cash, what's special about cash Cash is free of a ledger. There's no ledger where anything is written down. And what's special about digital money, it always has a digital ledger behind it. So while for cash, we don't need any regulation, we don't need any governance structure, except that if you spend more than 10,000 euros, you have to record it. But if you don't do any regulation, it is guaranteeing privacy. For digital money, it's exactly the other way around. In order to protect privacy, you need a governance structure and you have to intervene. And that makes, uh, makes uh, cash so different and CBDC so different. That's why one has to clearly think about how to design that. And uh, 
So if you think about, on, on the other hand, what's the big advantage of digital money? Of course, we all move much more to a virtual world. I mean, cash becomes less and less useful. But the big advantage is actually of digital money that you can combine it with some other ledgers. And you can make some condition payments, automatic payments, smart contracts, as Richard was talking about yesterday. And that means your ledger has to be interoperable with some other ledgers, meaning other blockchains, supply chains, some other elements to that. In Europe, the focus is very much on you know, consumer focused. Uh, it's related to consumers, but you should also think about supply chains. So think about a world in the future, the automotive industry will have, for example, a supply chain. The textile industry has a B2B platform supply chain, and they all have ledgers, they have a payment rail to it. So there is whenever there's a certain widget from one factory moves to another factory or some engine or whatever this is, there will be a sensor on these widgets and this will be recorded on this uh, supply chain ledger. And then the payment will happen automatically and the payment will be attached to a token and then the question is what currency will this token be denominated in? Will it be the dollar? Will it be the euro? And if you have a separate ledger, if you have a CBDC, how interoperable is the CBDC ledger with, uh, with the various supply chains? And this, as it sees, as it plays out now, probably, you know, there can be stable coins denominated in the dollar, and then they will be all denominated in the dollar, or you have some smart CBDC arrangement where there's some CBDC ledger interacting with uh, the private uh, supply chains. But it also means it's much harder if you have all these interacting uh, ledgers to keep privacy and how to design privacy. And essentially you can think of as you make all these ledgers interoperable to a meta ledger or some universal ledger, there's no privacy at all. So for privacy reasons, you would like to split this apart, this meta ledger in some jigsaw puzzle and everybody gets only one piece of it in order to protect the privacy. So on the one hand, we would like to connect everything in order to have programmable money or programmable wallets rather than money because you want to preserve the unit of account role. You don't want to have programmable money, you want programmable wallets, and you want to have everything connected to this meta ledger. But for privacy reasons, you would like to split this meta ledger in, in a jigsaw puzzle and everybody gets only access to part of the puzzle. And that will be the big challenge, how to design, conceptually think about this meta ledger and how to split it up and who gets access to what element to that. And in particular then, keeping in mind, you know, fighting crime, privacy and crime is always the connection, how much privacy do you want to give, how much freedom do you want to give, and how much do you want to be able to prosecute crime. And this is actually the big challenge uh, we are facing there. And more generally, if you think about the value of information people have, uh, what's the social value of information and what's the private value of information? It's not the same. So you should have privacy for your own DNA. You should have privacy for your own x-rays. But should you have privacy how the x-rays translates into some certain health issues, how your DNA translates into uh, certain cancer probabilities? That's not clear. So we have to have, on the one hand, you would like to have, give certain people or certain institutions access to the correlation structures of various DNAs and the cancer probabilities. But on the other hand, your individual DNA should be protected. And that makes it challenges to how to design and how to approach the privacy more generally because the social value and the private value is, is so different. And people also suffer from the privacy paradox that you know, they, are, they say they care a lot about privacy, but when they have to give it up to some company, they're very easily given up uh, for a low amount of money. And Finally, let me just raise one more issue about CBDC. There's the question, whom, I said, come back to trust. Money is about trust. It's a part of the social contract, and that's why you know, politicians have to be involved, the parliament has to be involved, the product group has to be involved. Um, and do people trust more the official sector, or do people trust more the tech companies? And that's, you know, that's, you have to have a certain governance structure to make sure that they trust more the official sector. And, and that everything is run uh, smoothly. So I'm raising more questions than answers, but uh, uh, it's just, it's a complex issue. It goes, the privacy issue is a much broader issue than money, but money is, is one of the core elements to that. Absolutely. Privacy turns out to be the most important feature of CBDCs in all uh, surveys, including the ECB survey that we conducted two years ago. Now, 
uh, you are a super expert in uh, technology, and my question would indeed focus on uh, technology. Uh, a burning issue in the CBDC debate is uh, the debate, uh, the relevance of choosing between centralized and decentralized technology. So my question would be, what are the trade-offs between a blockchain and a traditional centralized infrastructure to operate CBDCs? And second, how important is that CBDCs can be used offline? And do we have the necessary technology to uh, allow users to uh, use CBDCs offline? Thank you, Fabio, and thank you to the European Central Bank for, for having me at this event. So technology is vital, but I want to make a, an important point, which is that we shouldn't necessarily begin the conversation with which technology to use. First, we should focus on why CBDC at all. What are the social and policy goals that we might be trying to achieve? Then, what are the monetary choices and design choices needed to achieve those goals? And then, what are the technology options in order to implement those monetary and design choices? However, as a technologist, I have to say that technology work should be done in parallel with this process, because in part, uh, the technology determines what is even possible, so what we can even do. You need to understand what tools are in your toolbox, and in order to do that, we need to do technology experimentation very early on, rigorous technology experimentation. Uh, we need to create what I call a technology policy loop, where we bring technologists and policymakers together to feed into each other and move the work forward. So to answer your question, Fabio, about centralized versus decentralized, I want to be clear, CBDC does not require a blockchain in order to operate. Blockchain technology, the way I like to think about it, is that it is an umbrella term under which there are many different components. And we can actually pick and choose which components make sense for the goals that we're trying to achieve. So for example, we can get the features that we normally see in cryptocurrency systems like programmability or cryptographic designs for privacy or auditability or real-time settlement finality without necessarily using uh, a core component of DLT systems, which is the underlying distributed agreement. So just to talk about that for a moment, these systems, the distributed agreement component, are really designed for situations where there is no central body, there is no single organization that governs the system. And you have to note that in the word central bank digital currency, you have the word central right there. That's an important word. DLT technology might make more sense in contexts where there isn't a central governing body, where it really is a situation where you have multiple bodies that need to come together, and they can't create a central intermediary to do that governance for them, and they want to embed the rules of the system in the software. But just because we're not using the distributed agreement doesn't mean we can't use these other very interesting parts of blockchain technology as components. But CBDC, beyond the technology choice is also a structural choice. What are the core platform services that should be operated by or for the central bank versus what should be done by various intermediaries? And I want to make a point here that to date we've been using a fairly oversimplified model where the pictures will have a central bank and then they will have sort of a vague PSP or payment services provider. But in fact, there will probably be a very wide variety of potential intermediaries and they will take on a wide variety of roles, sometimes perhaps in cooperation, to achieve what traditionally might be done by a commercial bank today. And this impacts quite a few policy trade-offs. So who will see what information, who has what responsibilities, and how easy it will be to innovate on this architecture. Speaking specifically about offline capabilities, yes, CBDC should absolutely have offline capabilities. This is very important for robustness. Uh, for example, to tolerate natural disasters, which might knock out communication infrastructure, but also for low connectivity areas, for example, in emerging markets. We often use the phrase digital cash uh, to describe CBDC, and I actually think this is a great framing. I think it's very helpful. We should think about approximating some of the more useful properties of cash, like that it works offline, as an example, but also uh, that it does not require an advanced mobile device, and it does not require someone signing up for an account with a private company 
or signing a terms of use in order to be paid. Um, we should also think about what we can do beyond cash. So cash is a useful starting point, but the technology can able, enable us to do so much more than that, like cryptographic designs for privacy or strong accountability. Uh, but to start, I would argue approaching CBDC design from the perspective of creating a digital bearer instrument to have the best chance of achieving its promise. We have this opportunity where we can think creatively and we don't have to be trapped by the existing paradigm of commercial bank accounts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nea. Very clear. And I think we should now get closer to the economics of CBDC. And uh, Ulrich, I would like to raise you a question on this. Um, another crucial uh, question that is, uh, how can I say, agitating financial intermediaries for legitimate uh, reasons is what implications could introducing a CBDC have on the banking sector? What would be the impact on financial stability and how could negative side effects be best mitigated? Again, this is a very important issue that, as I said, for legitimate reasons, uh, financial intermediaries are discussing quite intensively. So it would be important to clarify this, Ulrich. Yeah, thanks, uh, Fabio, for that question. And yeah, it agitates uh, commercial <laughs> banks, but it even agitated central bankers for a while. Um, I mean, the term CBDC, if you go back to the early days where this uh, topic is discussed, you know, I think that the term was really invented, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe by Michael Kum of, of, from the Bank of England in 2016. And in his very, very first paper, he already talks about this topic. And then, um, central bankers in this uh, CPMI Markets Committee report of March 2018 also gave really big importance to this uh, topic and and yeah for for understandable reasons commercial banks are also very very keen on this uh, topic so yeah it's um, it's an old topic I mean now we are maybe more confident in the meantime and Cecilia has already started to give answers what what to do so um, I think it's important first, as also Cecilia did, to distinguish the field of, uh, I would formulate a bit differently, the um, store of value function of uh, money versus the means of payment function of money. Both are functions of money. And in the field of the store of value um, function, um, yeah, the case is clear. You know, you have uh, in the euro area, maybe around 10 trillion of uh, deposits with banks, uh, which uh, you know, could, if CBDC is, is very attractive, also a store of value, flow away. I mean, CBDC has a good competitive starting position in that field because it is uh, completely risk-free and uh, completely liquid. Um, but um, that is not what central banks want. Central banks don't want to crowd out all the central banks which introduce uh, CBDC um, or which consider it, study it, I mean, emphasize they don't want to crowd out banks. They don't want to see their balance sheet uh, ballooning when uh, introducing CBDC. So how to do that? Um, I think amongst economists, and I understand this forum is, is a forum for economists uh, primarily, but not only. Amongst economists, I think one can, uh, you know, argue or start from the interest rate perspective, you could say an anomaly of banknotes is that regardless where the short-term risk-free interest rate is, they are always remunerated at zero, so that the store of value properties of banknotes are completely different if you are today, let's say, in Turkey, where you have 14% nominal interest rate, or the euro area where you have a, a negative interest rate at the short end. So, you know, that is unintended that banknotes have such different store of value um, properties depending on the interest rate level. So one could say for CBDC, this, you know, physical constraint is no longer necessary. And uh, it, uh, yeah, it could be considered and remuneration would therefore also be a way to steer the relative, let's say, unattractiveness of CBDC as a store of value. And you know you can do that also through a tiered remuneration 
where you would have, um, you know, a certain limitation of, uh, in the case of the euro area with negative rates as it is uh, prevailing still now, of a zero remuneration and then for large holdings, uh, even a negative remuneration. But uh, yeah, we don't leave, live in a, in a world of economists only, maybe fortunately, and uh, lawyers, you know, citizens, politicians, they, they get very skeptical and fearful if they hear about the non-zero remuneration, even of tiered uh, um, remuneration of CBDC. And, and typically, you know, those uh, people, they see the point of limiting CBDC as their value, but it brings them quickly to the conclusion that the limits um, are an effective uh, solution also in crisis situations. And actually, if you look at the CBDCs, which are currently being deployed, all of them, or have been deployed, all of them um, have some quantity limits. I mean, in some cases, pretty, pretty high compared, let's say, to GDP per capita, but uh, they always have some, some limitations because this point was seen and limits somehow, you know, can be explained a very simple uh, are effective. I mean, they're not beautiful, of course, because they limit the elasticity of the use. They also have the drawback that it's not clear um, how you calibrate them for corporate usages, so you have to be creative there what, uh, what to do. But uh, I think, yeah, the fact is that those who deployed CBDC tended to choose limits. Um, on individual holdings. And I would say that works. There's no doubt that this works. That can be done. The limits should not be too low. At the beginning, deployment of a CBDC takes time. And, uh, you know, you should not uh, constrain it in addition excessively by very low limits. But, okay, I would say intellectually, this problem is not so complex. It is, uh, I would always pretend to say it is solved. You can do it at least through limits or through tiered remuneration. And then the other more tricky question, and again, Cecilia has touched upon it, is, uh, you know, the competition uh, also with banks or, I mean, maybe more with other providers in the field of, of retail payments, really. This is where central banks want to have CBDC being successful. Of course, again, you know, not successful to the extent to crowd out others. We want to keep the coexistence, the competition, between central bank money and commercial bank money. And, and here I would say this is a more tricky part. There's no you know, simple way to put a limit like you can have on holdings in payments. I have no doubt that CBDC can be designed in a way to be very successful. You, know, you can have a very low you know, merchant fees. You could have a legal tender status. You have those economies of scale. You have the credibility as a central bank. So you can, you can do, make this very successful, but you can also fail. I mean, you said it, Fabio, at the beginning, the success of CBDC is not just a fair accompli. You know, it has to be achieved by a good design, attractive for users and distributors, merchants. So um, hitting there, the middle ground, is, uh, is more, you know, <laughs> interesting. Um, I'm sure it will be possible. I believe part of the solution is to, you know, give um, to CBDC some special unique features, you know, to on one side cover the big use cases, POI payments, because that's where the network effects come from, but then also, you know, seek to have it have some unique properties. You know, it will never be so distinguishable from private uh, payment instruments like banknotes where, you know, there the coexistence was very stable. It will always be more tricky to have uh, a stable coexistence, but uh, I believe that some distinguishability will be a key uh, component of that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you very much. So we have ways to address the fear of disintermediation by banks. Uh, let me now turn to monetary policy. After all, this is a conference organized by a central bank. Marcus, uh, what role uh, could a CBDC play in the transmission of monetary policy? What features would be required to make CBDCs most effective and efficient in this respect? 
Yeah, that, I think that's a very important aspect of CBDCs, and that depends very much on the design of the CBDC, uh, which design feature one goes for. The first thing I would like to mention is that uh, one reason to have CBDCs is also to overcome certain uh, forms of fragmentation. So we see, historically, if we go back in history, we had many, many currencies and banknotes floating out in parallel, and it was a big achievement to have a uniform currency, a common measure. Uh, this, and we see also in the digital space now a fragmentation of a lot of currencies. And what I argued in a report with Chopin Landour for the European Parliament, that one big advantage of CBDC to have a uniform uh, anchor and currency and avoid the fragmentation also in the area. And it, you shouldn't take it for granted because we saw denomination risk and other things. And CBDC will be helpful in that. The second thing, of course, is how much you know, monetary policy, how will it be more effective, less effective uh, with CBDC in place? And that depends very much uh, on the design of the CBDC. And one obvious thing is what uh, Ulrich was mentioning to, do you pay interest rate on CBDCs, positive or negative? And if you think about it, if you hike the interest rate right now, the deposit rate will not go up because the banks have some market power. So the deposit rate typically is lagging and is also falling. So that means whenever any tightening cycle will be translated with a delay, it of course will affect the loan market, it will affect the credits, but on the deposit and the saving side, it's not transmitting through directly one for one for sure. If you have a CBDC, which is also paying an interest rate, the transmission would be much more direct and the market power of the banks would go away and as which typically the market power is very low when the interest rate of the central bank is low and is, go, is going up when the interest rate of the central bank is, is high. And that also leads the banks to have a different maturity may, match because essentially market power moves up uh, whenever the Fed hikes interest rates or the central bank is hiking the interest rates. It also has implications, so the market power, and the question is what's the reason why we should actually grant market power to the banks, so to what extent we should grant market power to the banks, and that determines then how much the CBDC interest rate should also move with the policy rate. Should you also go negative? And that's another thing, it might make the CBDC very unpopular, so it might make it uh, less attractive to things, but you might be able to get around uh, the zero lower bound or the reversal interest rate. So in this sense, there are many aspects where you can go around it. But it also opens up a lot of opportunities, but it also opens up whenever you have a lot of opportunities, there's also a lot of potential to abuse it. So you can be way more effective in terms of financial repression. So you can actually implement measures which impose a much higher inflation tax on the lower middle class. They have the savings mostly in nominal claims. And one has to be careful about that. And one has to think about safeguards uh, to make sure in order to preserve the trust in CBDC, uh, which I think is very important. And with regard to monetary policy, of course, monetary policy is there to stimulate and slow down the economy. If the economy is overheating, you slow it down. If it's uh, in a recession, you can stimulate if you have a demand shortage. And you, that's the key part of monetary sovereignty. It's not really the senior rich income. It's like the key part is that you can stimulate and slow down the economy. So you give the economy through the, the power of monetary policy of some resilience uh, in, in the policy way. And the question is, how can you preserve this uh, uh, resilience or the power of monetary policy? Uh, and this is particular in the face of digital dollarization. So if other currencies take over, and become more attractive. So the currency competition will be much more pronounced. And the way I see it across the globe, how will this digital landscape play out? So if you compare the US, Europe, uh, let's say China, and the, the emerging economies, how would, could one envision and conjecture how the world will look like? And the way I would say in the US, it's more likely they will move to a framework, so that's speculative, to a framework of stable coins. There will be a lot of private stable coins. They will be connected with certain supply chains. Uh, these tokens of the supply chains will be stable coins, so they will be extremely well integrated uh, in that. And this will be very, a big space to play, and that's why, which will make the dollar even more prominent. So the whole digitalization through well-regulated uh, stable coins will actually make the dollar more dominant uh, in, in that space. And, and it is less likely that the, the US will actually be at the forefront of the CBDC development. 
Uh, of course, there's also an issue how to regulate then the stable coins. There's, you know, we just saw a huge implosion of stable coins. So that's what the presidential working group uh, was giving out the report late last year, with focusing uh, on that element. The, Europe is much more focused and consumer focused. Um, it is very much focused, uh, you know, providing consumers some alternative, but it also might be used as a catalyst to stimulate the private sector to push ahead European payment initiative and other things to make uh, uh, things uh, go faster and stimulate uh, the banking sector to, to make the next steps in the digitalization move. In China, it's much more, uh, where Alipay and WeChat pay two big tech, big tech companies expanding, not only domestically, but also abroad. So if you think about the dominance of the dollar will expand through this stable coins denominated in dollars. If you think about Europe, it will be more inward focused, I presume. If you think about China, they could expand a lot with these two big, big tech companies. Uh, and they're reaching out. So if you go in the US, there are many uh, friends I have, when they go to a Chinese restaurant, they pay with Alipay and WeChat in Remimbi. So the concept of a currency area is shifting. It moves to a digital currency area, which is not necessarily given by national boundaries. It's more given which space you're moving in, which virtual space you're moving in. So there's some digital currencies evolving. And China has the possibility, in order to establish its currency, through the big tech companies to expand uh, globally, but of course they're cramping down on them, which makes it harder to uh, expand globally. But that's, that's one, I, nevertheless, I see these two big companies expanding and uh, going this. And all of these developments make actually the big currencies more prominent, more powerful, and that of course scares the heck out of smaller countries and emerging economies. And that's why they are on the forefront of introducing CBDCs in order to defend their currency from the foreign currencies taking over. And uh, because they will lose their monetary power, monetary policy power. They would like to have also the ability to stimulate the economy when they're in a recession or uh, slow down the economy when the economy is overheating. And that's essentially the, the challenge uh, we are facing. But overall, uh, it's very different across the globe, uh, the, the challenges uh, what different countries face, but I think it's very important to maintain the monetary sovereignty, in particular the, the power of uh, conducting monetary policy. And uh, that depends very much on the design and also depends, uh, you know, do you pay interest rate to allow non-residents holding this uh, CBDC or not? How much do you want to, for the transition from, you know, if you pay interest, you might squeeze some of the market power of the banks out. Will this create in the transition phase some financial stability? How do you manage the transition phase? And it might interact with uh, financial stability in this regard as well. So let me leave it at this point. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks a lot. Uh, another key issue is the impact of CBDCs on international capital flows. And I turn to you, Cecilia. Uh, you are working within the FSB on this topic. And um, my question would be, what consequences could the issuance of a CBDC have on other jurisdictions, including through cross-border payments? Uh, would the use by non-residents have an impact on other currencies? And how likely are scenarios of currency substitution, in particular, in emerging markets? And how can uh, such risks, if they are risks, be mitigated. Okay. Um, so we, we already know that uh, cross-border payment systems uh, face many challenges, the high funding costs, there's long transaction chains, complex compliance procedures, mismatch of operating hours and the likes. And we also know that from a client perspective, it's pretty expensive and opaque and it time, takes time. Um, so my sort of weekend job uh, for the last year and a half has been to, to uh, chair one of the uh, G20 uh, building blocks when it comes to, actually three of them, uh, but one of them is, uh, is about looking into whether CBDCs could be part of a solution to, to improve cross-border payments. And, uh, well, uh, I have to be humble. Uh, CBDC is not any kind of silver bullet that will solve all the problems. Uh, but you can address some of them. So uh, it's going to be hot off the press. In two weeks' time, we're going to uh, publish a report uh, ahead of the uh, meeting in Bali that is kind of looking into 
uh, access options and, and interoperability options that different CBDC systems um, could have. Um, uh, first of all, um, there is a sort of we're sort of an interesting time in history because so many central banks are looking into this. So there is a bit of a sort of clean slate to kind of factoring in if we can uh, evolve the cross-border payment system at the same time as central banks are looking into this for their own sake. So I think uh, it's an opportunity, if there is enough appetite for it, to, to, to build 24-7 uh, systems straight through processing, and then we can sort of avoid a lot of the frictions that we have today. There still has to be harmonization, uh, compliance checks and the likes, um, but I think looking into this or using CBDCs can sort of push uh, this work forward also when it comes to other ways to, to improve the uh, cross-border payment world. Now, I said uh, we have been looking into uh, different access models and we looked at how to make systems interoperable. And it's always the same thing. Uh, if you want to make it really efficient, it's going to get hard to get there. Um, so we are looking at different sort of uh, level of ambitions, if I may say so. Um, so first, when it comes to granting access, of course, it would be a lot more efficient if uh, even foreign PSPs, uh, payment service providers, has access to a, a particular uh, central bank digital currency that would create a, a more open and more efficient system. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some countries would, would probably find that a bit uh, too risky and there, there has to be sort of lower levels of, of uh, access ambitions. There you can think about sponsored models where a PSB has a connection to a domestic PSB and then come into to the central bank service offering CBDC. Uh, the other aspect when it comes to uh, access is about what sort of possibilities should you have as an individual accessing other countries' CBDCs, and should there be caps or fees? Should you be allowed to hold another country's CBDC through uh, when you're there as a tourist, or should you be having um, a full throttle to be able to, to hold unlimited amounts? And here I think there would also be uh, different choices and different level of frictions that countries would, would like to choose. So uh, there won't be sort of one, one access model to, to, uh, to work for everybody. Also interoperability. Uh, I think we're going to have to face the fact not all, not, not all countries of the world is uh, prepared to play nicely with all other countries of the world. So uh, we have to think about different levels of, of um, interoperability. The best thing, obviously, is to build a single system, uh, but it's going to be jolly hard to, for everybody who wants to be part of that to, to agree on, on governance and supervision and the likes. So we can also think about interoperability on sort of lower level, uh, compatibility level, pretty low, interlinking somewhere in between. And I think if the world goes down in the, the, and introducing, and in this case, it's actually a wholesale CBDC we're talking about, um, there will probably be a, a little bit of a patchwork, kind of different, different models uh, depending on, on national appetites. Um, so I said, mentioned that it's a clean slate uh, and we have the opportunity to consider cross-border functionalities from the start. Uh, and I think this could also uh, provide benefits and serve segments of the markets that are currently being underserved. Uh, and by providing as open infrastructures as possible, uh, that could possibly help uh, promote competition in the payment markets not only domestically, but also cross-border. Uh, and uh, putting a bit of pressure on private solutions, the, here I think our work is important. And the last thing I'll say about this is that tech solutions, uh, although very key to this, they will only take us part of the way. Uh, what really will make a difference is governance. So we have to decide on standards, regulations, supervisory uh, uh, committees, etc. Uh, otherwise, uh, this will not work. And it goes with this all uh, of the G20 building blocks when it comes to improving cross-border payments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Uh, now, uh, again, on technology, Nea. Uh, technology offers 
new opportunities, but of course it also creates uh, new risks. And when we uh, discuss CBDCs, uh, uh, we should start discussing cyber risk. So my question would be how realistic is the threat of future cyber attacks on CBDCs and how can central banks most effectively prepare to neutralize them, if we can neutralize them? So a useful framing I have that perhaps is surprising to some people is that the best way to secure data is not to see or store it at all. And so I think this is an interesting approach because it goes hand in hand with privacy. The best way to make whatever central service is being run to support a CBDC resilient is to make sure it's not an attractive target. How can we reduce the amount of data that's actually being stored there? And that reduces the risk if something happens, for example. Now that's not enough, but it goes to show that security and privacy can go hand in hand. And if we can work on privacy preserving designs, that actually helps with security risks. In addition to that, it's important to use well understood and hardened technology. So this means well known cryptographic primitives that have uh, been used widely in practice and also best practices from system design. So not necessarily the latest and greatest technology from the cryptocurrency world, though there is a lot to learn from the cryptocurrency world. And to be quite frank, we wouldn't be having this conversation about CBDC at all if it weren't for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And using advances in technology, we can actually introduce designs into a CBDC which reduce risk by removing the need for users to rely on third parties who might fail or disappear or lose user funds. So we can actually give users the tools and auditors and regulators the tools they need uh, to do cryptographic auditability, to distribute data, and to distribute control. And this is very powerful because, again, it removes that idea of the central honeypot for attackers, instead making it the data and the control more distributed. Mitigating cyber attacks as well will need to be thought of as a public-private partnership. And we have examples from industry where we see the public sector and the private sector working together to develop standards, sometimes to self-regulate. Um, we should think about how to regulate based on risks and roles that the intermediaries take on. And as I said before, these might be new risks and roles, so it's important to note that. And to think about how to promote transparency competition and openness so that users have recourse in the case that an intermediary is hacked or loses control of funds or something like that. So here, really, the technology has an important role to play in improving the potential for cybersecurity, reducing the risks associated with cybersecurity. And we have to introduce those, that thinking and those designs early on in the process. If my reading of the clock is correct, we are perfectly on time. So we have time for questions. I would suggest that we take three questions uh, from the audience and one from the virtual audience. I see Vidor Costanzio already raised his hand. Vidor, of course. And then others, please signal. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. I have three questions. Uh, one for uh, Ulrich. In the initial literature about CBDCs, there was a stark dis distinction between CBDCs as digital tokens and as deposits in the central bank. That distinction seems to have disappeared uh, over time, and it's uh, really not clear even in uh, uh, many of the texts and literature, including academic literature, about CBDCs. Uh, I think there is a distinction, of course, about privacy, it's clear to everyone, but also about the technical possibility of paying interest uh, if it takes the form of digital tokens and the central bank has no direct connection with the end users and how long they have had those digital tokens. And that's why I tend to be uh, more against the idea of deposits in the central bank than digital token uh, um, uh, 
uh, version, which, by the way, is one that it is used uh, in Sweden and China, uh, where the thing is more uh, developed. So what do you think about this distinction? And if indeed it would be, in a way, also quite easy to pay interest on digital tokens, uh, if it is indeed possible. Uh, second question, also briefly to Cecilia. Uh, I have followed uh, your uh, experience and your texts and oh, the, the technical details. And I have a question about if you have any um, uh, prediction or even already knowledge about the degree of demand of private citizens for digital tokens uh, that are indirectly issued by the central bank because the end users only have contact with the intermediaries and uh, uh, not the central bank, which keeps, of course, the main network and has this actuarial uh, uh, function uh, to validate the, the tokens. Um, but in countries like Sweden, other than advanced economies that are already well digitalized and where payment systems already are in use for decades and people are used to them, uh, what would be the demand for digital tokens that would be, you know, as a vocation mainly uh, targeting the substitution of notes and nothing else? Third question to uh, Marcus about the internationalization and the cross-border payments. Yes, you mentioned that private uh, big companies are an agent or a vehicle of that, and there are indeed uh, dozens of uh, digital platforms uh, that do these uh, uh, cross-border uh, changes uh, between uh, currencies and all of that. But do you think that that by itself could lead to a real problem of uh, uh, currency substitution, or if there would be the development of several projects with the aim of interoperability uh, between central banks and the official side of CBDCs, would that by itself augment and create the risk of currency substitution? and? Uh, the project that exists between China, Thailand, and the uh, Emirates. Uh, I, I, I have read texts by the Thailand Central Bank very afraid of what currency substitution could result if the project is developed in certain ways. Thank you. I think I saw a hand there. Yeah. Can I please ask you to identify yourself in your affiliation? I'm sorry, I don't know everybody. Yeah, hi, my name is Harald Uli from the University of Chicago. So, um, how do I mean, I have two questions. So, one is on the Goldilocks problem that you mentioned. I mean, how did we get to even talk about CBDC? I think it was the threat from Libra and then DM, you know, that, that made central banks wake up and say, hey, we need to introduce a CBDC. But then, as they kept thinking about CBDC, the bank said, hey, wait a moment, you know, this may lead to disintermediation. We don't want you to pay interest on it. Can't you make sure that people don't hold a lot of that stuff? Can you make it sufficiently unattractive? So I think there's a real challenge here, and it seems to me that we may be in the risk of designing a St. Anthony dollar for those that really, really want it, but you know, we don't want it to make it attractive so that it's used on a widespread basis. So where, where exactly do you see the Goldilocks solution to this? It's unclear to me. I have a question to Neha, which is, um, I mean, I totally agree that the central bank could maintain a centralized ledger, and the centralized ledger could be open to smart contracts and so forth, allowing you know DeFi applications and so forth. But it seems to me that there's a lot of industry. De I mean, there's a lot of industry demand to have a wholesale CBDC for that reason. But the industry is moving to the Ethereum blockchain to do all that, right? There's a whole infrastructure already developing. So how do you see this? Should there should there be a wrapped uh, uh, you know, a, a, a CBDC on the Ethereum blockchain that some are maintained by the by the central bank, uh, and, and why can't that be solved by having a narrow bank that that is regulated and does a stable coin on the Ethereum blockchain? Or do you envision you know a, a ledger that the central bank maintains as an alternative, as a public infrastructure that's that's opened up to writing all kinds of contracts? And don't you? Don't, I mean, are there problems that that come with that? Thanks. Uh, Steve Cecchetti from Brandeis University. Uh, 
Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I had a lot of questions when you started, but I have fewer now. So, um, so I, I think that's probably a good thing. My, my remaining questions are two. two. The, the, the very short and simple one is, I've always thought one of the problems with financial access was identity verification. And how is it that we solve the identity verification problem? It doesn't seem that CBDC has a whole lot to do with that. Um, the other reason, of course, people don't have bank accounts is they don't have any money, and that's not solved either, I don't think. Um, so, uh, so the question is whether or not that's really a problem. The second one is to think about the disintermediation and currency substitution problems as being problems in stress circumstances. So these are problems that, uh, that we think about in what I think of as sort of certain kinds of states of the world. Now, one of the reasons that I believe we have central banks is to ensure elastic supplies of currency under stress. Um, and the only way to ensure that bank deposits and central bank uh, central bank money trade at par is for there to be an elastic supply. And we don't want there to be, I don't think, um, s states of the world in, in which um, central bank money and bank deposits do not trade at par. Um, and so the question is, how do you ensure that those exist without offering unlimited supplies of central bank money under all states of the world? Thank you, Steve. I would now turn to our virtual audience, and I would give the floor to uh, Professor Vives uh, from ESF Business School. Uh, Sergei, you Thank have you. the floor. Thank you. Hi, Fabio. Um, Hi. So I, I have two uh, main uh, questions. The, the first one, uh, it's a little bit provocative. Um, uh, I, I have heard and read many policy papers on the issue, and I've seen many objectives. Uh, to introduce from the public point of view, to introduce a CBDC, adapting to the digital era, um, improving the efficiency of payments, including cross-border payments, preserving privacy, uh, fostering financial inclusion. Uh, my impression is that when I see so many objectives, I see too many reasons. So maybe there is no good reason. So the, 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 the question is, what is the main market failure that CBDC is addressing? So I would like I don't know, to question the panel, what's at the forefront? No? Because otherwise, it will be a solution in search of a problem, no? as the report on the, the, this committee of the Chamber of Lords in the UK uh, posited. Right? And, and in this sense, and a, a little bit as, as in Harold's question, um, uh, to me, now CBDC looks more like a defensive move by central banks fearing the entry of platforms in digital money, like was the case of Libra and Facebook, or of foreign digital currencies. But probably this is not a good enough reason to have a defensive uh, reason. No? Um, a, a recent report uh, by uh, my school and CPR, in fact, in which uh, Fabio provided a speech and comments also from Nija and Ulrich, so I just missed two panelists here, um, <laughs> concludes basically you know, that uh, a main problem is competition in payment systems, but it's not clear that competition in payment systems, the best way is uh, to introduce a CBDC, if this is the problem, that's one. And the other, and this is more of a question, I guess, for the panel, is a question of speed. Um, in, in our report, I think we concluded that um, CBDC, and in particular the retail variety, should not be rushed, in particular in, in, in developed economies, until both when the technology and the economics are compelling. No? And I would like to question the panel on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sergei. So if you agree, I would give the floor to each of the four panelists. No, yeah, four. Ulrich is uh, still online. For two minutes, so that we would uh, be within the time limits. Should I start with, uh, with you, Cecilia? OK, thank you very much. Uh, so Francesc? Apologies for mispronunciation, and the gentleman there was kind of alluding to what is the, actually the real problem here, and are there no other solutions to, to um, the um, uh, imagined or real problem? Uh, my sales pitch for this uh, is that this is an investment to protect the integrity of the monetary system, EA, the fiat money system, for all time. I see it as an evolution of the central bank role rather than a revolution. Uh, I think cash will disappear as a payment method, that's for sure. 
I think you were perhaps simplifying a bit when you said that uh, we're talking CBDC because we got Libra. This discussion started much earlier because the really driving force here is digitalization. It, and if you look at the various arguments and reasoning by central banks are looking into it, they all rhyme. They all rhyme. They're all kind of the same forces that society changes and we have to change with it. And this Riksbank was formed, when the Riksbank was formed, we did copper coins weighing in 20 kilos each. If we hadn't changed then, we would have been out of business a long time ago and someone else would have provided the service that society needs. Uh, Vitor, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, China and Sweden. Uh, China is already out. We are still at an experimental phase, so I'd just like to point that out. We have done some estimates on uh, demand. Uh, jolly difficult. It depends on what you assume, obviously. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers on the top of my mind, but we have estimated to some, some assumptions exercise 7 to 10 percent of GDP. And if you add that on top of the current 1% of GDP, uh, which is the cash, and you think about that as this kind of future M0, uh, I mean, that's slower than most countries. Uh, but we can discuss the uh, um, uh, assumptions. Uh, Stephen Cicchetti, I agree fully, digital ID is, uh, is critical. It also needs to be uh, maintained cross-border. And I'm also happy to hear that we agree that the importance of protecting parity one-to-one. -one. And I think this could be done also through reserves, which is also uh, in the Riks Bank to uh, sorry, the Central Bank uh, toolbox. Um, and I'll stop there. Nea, yeah, you want to go? Yeah. So to address a subset of those questions. Uh, so first, I want to address the question around tokens and accounts, this language. So um, I, I, for one, am a bit happy we've lost those terms, and let me explain why. I think the problem is that they were overbundled, and that, in addition, they meant different things to different people. So to economists, it's very clear. Token and account is a digital bearer instrument versus uh, something where identity is intermediated by a third party to access your funds. But to computer scientists, it's about the data model, UTXO versus account balance. But there's one more point, which is that uh, in the digital realm, you cannot have a digital bearer asset that can be self-validating. So in the physical realm, we have, we have bearer assets. We can pass them peer to peer. We don't have to involve a third party. In the digital realm, you cannot do that with digital objects because they can be so easily copied. And so I think this has led to a lot of confusion, a lot of overbundling of different ideas that go with the token versus account terminology. And so uh, people have stepped back from using that and speaking more about specifics, privacy, uh, is it, should it be peer to peer? How exactly is access uh, gated? How is it authorized, et cetera? So I'll speak to that. Uh, to Harold's comments on um, you know, how much exactly infrastructure and how, much, how many services would a central bank provide? Would they provide a fully featured smart contracting language? I don't know the answer to that. And I, I think it's going to be quite different for different central banks. They're, they're each going to take uh, a look at, at, at the risks and rewards, and they're going to make their own decisions. Um, I hope that central banks will offer at least some modicum of programmability if they were to choose to launch CBDCs. And so far, they seem interested in that, simply because it's where a lot of the promise lies. Uh, I think that quite a bit of functionality can be built at other layers. It doesn't necessarily have to look exactly the way that cryptocurrencies look, where a fully featured smart contracting programming language is embedded in whatever the central bank runs. Now, as to your question as to, well, why do that instead of just launching stable coins on top of Ethereum that are backed by a central bank, I think the key question here is governance. Uh, just because the central bank is launching a stable coin on Ethereum doesn't mean that they would be able to govern the system. In fact, the governance of the system would still be determined by the validators, the anonymous distributed global validators of the Ethereum blockchain who would determine exactly how contracts are executed and, and which transactions are recorded or not recorded. They would determine the transaction fees, for example. So, I mean, if, if a central bank wants to give up that level of control of governance to uh, an anonymous set of validators, then, then then by all means make that choice. But uh, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the wisest route. Thank you. Uh, Marcus? Yeah. Thanks a lot for all these questions. Let me, I totally agree with Nia about the account where it was token based. I think this was a confusing uh, categorization. But it's, yeah, it's very good. If you want to go to digital currency, it's very hard. 
Uh, concerning the, the currency substitution thing, so I think there is more currency substitution, so competition accounts currencies will be more severe. Also, when you, once, you think about if there are several tokens and the tokens are denominated in a particular currency, who is deciding that you switch this whole supply chain token to another currency? So while in the older days right now, there's, you have to coordinate from going from one currency to another currency, so a lot of citizens have to coordinate, there will be a lot of central organizations deciding, okay, we switch now the currency, then you have way more hard switches uh, going on. So currency substitution will change a lot, the competition among currencies will change. Uh, concerning uh, Harold's questions about um, Ethereum and interoperability, uh, I would like to add one more aspect to it uh, is there's a political economy aspect to it. Of course, you have a tendency now of the private sector to start stable coins uh, and essentially get a lot of synergy revenue, get very wealthy, and then later on get essentially validated by the official sector and get uh, essentially uh, this declared as public money. And this way, certain people can get enormously rich uh, this way. So that's, I think, uh, one way to go, but it's probably not the optimal, it's not in the public interest to go this, uh, this around. Um, concerning in stress times, I think Steve asked this, you know, uh, in stress times you have to have the uniformity uh, guaranteed uh, and, and bail out. What happens if there's a, a bank run in particular? Uh, uh, I think, uh, you can always, it will change the nature of, uh, of the central bank, but what do you have in mind? So when you do a bank run now, you withdraw cash. In, in the current world, you can always do a silent bank run by withdrawing money from one bank and run to another bank, which is, seems to be very sound. So the bank run probability is already there, uh, and you will have the same as another safe haven, the CBDC. We can run on the CBDC, but the central bank will see it right away and can just channel the funds back. So if the bank is sound and solvent, you can channel just the funds back. So there's way quicker information flow and it's much quicker uh, to react to that. If there's a whole run on the whole banking system and uh, the money flows out of the country, so that's what's going on, can go on right now as well, uh, with our capital controls. If there's a, instead of, instead of the money flowing out of the country, it's actually flowing to the CBDC, again, it's a better situation uh, for the central bank to channel the funds back and stabilize the system because it's not leaving the country, it stays in the country or in the, in the currency area. Uh, with regard to what is the purpose of CBDC, I mean, there are many reasons what uh, the purpose of the CBDC are. Of course, conceptually as a question, uh, or let me start this way, at the moment, the anchor is the euro, and ultimately the anchor is that you can convert uh, your deposits into some cash, in some euro cash. And if, when cash becomes less useful, this anchor is going away. So do we need and have to replace this cash anchor with a no modern anchor, like a modern CBDC, or can we do it without an anchor? And there's an argument to made, you can actually also do it without an anchor, by just having a bank regulation, lender of last resort functions, and some deposit insurance. So you have all these three together, these three instruments together could also create an anchor, and preserve the anchor as, as a denomination, everything in euros. And, but that's an experiment. So we have never had a system where we don't have this cash anchor, where you can go to official currency uh, and this. And CBDC would be natural equivalent to this cash anchor, but we can make a bigger leap forward and get rid of any anchor, but we don't know, and that's a big experiment. And the question is, do we want to have this experiment or not? Or is it more natural, the transition, to have a CBDC as, a, as an anchor replacing cash, what we had before? So let me leave it at that. Th thank you, Marcus. Um, Ulrich, two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks then to Nea for having answered the question of uh, Vitor on, on tokens versus accounts. And indeed, you know, I could list at least four different meanings of uh, tokens as they has been, ha have been used. And that's why we also got rid of this uh, terminology. In any case, I think central banks tended to conclude that um, holdings of CBDC need to be associated to a name, to an identity, uh, to a holder. And that's uh, the um, necessity then also for remuneration and, and limitations. And on uh, limits, I think, Steve, you asked uh, why, I mean, how can you always preserve a parity between commercial bank money and central bank money if you have uh, limits? I think there's, I mean, you cannot have, of course, an aggregate limit and say 
I will only issue 1 trillion euro in CBDC, but you can have individual limits again for holders. And then there is just no secondary market. You know, if I ask uh, someone on the street, uh, give me CBDC, you know, if I, at the end, I will have a claim towards that person's account on CBDC, it's not CBDC any longer because it's an IOU issued by this person. <laughs> and therefore it has not the value of CBDC. So there's just no secondary market if you limit um, the supply of CBDC via individual holdings of a CBDC and th therefore it's, it's not an issue. And then again on why CBDC at all, I would uh, be even maybe more radical than, than Marcus in answering this question. So, you know, banknotes is just one form of central bank liability. It was not the first form of central bank uh, monetary liabilities. And it, there's no reason why it should be the one and, and only and everlasting. It's technology, you could say, from the 17th century. There's no reason why the central bank should not follow evolution of society, as Cecilia has called it, and also move into the digital age. And this is, you could say, a conservative move. It's not a revolutionary move because it, it preserves the two-layer monetary system, which has served us uh, well. And um, I mean, Marcus, you were saying maybe there is a way where we don't need uh, effective convertibility into central bank money, but commercial bank money is nothing else, you could say, than a promise of conversion into central bank money. Now, well, that's what commercial bank money is. So if this, uh, this definition of commercial bank money is, uh, is a fictitious one, then I don't know what uh, commercial bank money will be in, in practice. So for me, it is just you know, moving with time, accepting um, digitalization of society, rejecting the claim that central banks are natural issuers of banknotes uh, only as a monetary liability. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, I think we can bring this panel to a conclusion. And first of all, I want to thank all for this uh, fascinating uh, discussion, which I believe has shown that the debate on CBDC is moving from the theoretical rationale for introducing a central bank digital currency to uh, uh, implementation aspects. Uh, I will not try to, to draw any conclusion, even though I wrote my conclusion. I will only make one comment on this question of whether CBDC is uh, a solution in search of a problem. I, I really don't think so. I think that uh, we should uh, start this discussion by considering that cash is becoming less and less popular. And uh, we cannot rule out the possibility that in the future, people will not be willing to use cash, or they will not be able to use cash because the world will be digitalized. In that case, if cash disappears because there's no more demand for cash, we would have an economy without a safe asset. And uh, we know from the experience uh, from economic history, for example, from the experience of the free banking periods in the US, in the UK, in Switzerland, in Italy, that when there is no safe asset, uh, the financial sector is vulnerable to crisis. In a way, the instability we have observed on the market for cryptos might be traced back to the fact that they were not convertible into a safe asset. You can use, not use, easily use them to convert into uh, uh, riskless central bank money. And this means that uh, users, holders of cryptos, have very little information on the value. So those uh, investments are prone to runs. So we want to avoid to be trapped in a situation in which we realize that the absence of a safe asset triggers instability. Also because in order to introduce a, a CBDC, it takes several years. We are not issuing a CBDC. We are getting ready if something happens. We are ready to intervene. And may well be the case that somebody in some other continent will use and, and introduce a CBDC, which could be used for international transactions. Maybe that we could have a currency substitution also in large um, e uh, economic jurisdictions. We, you should not forget that, of course, this is not an imminent risk, but we should not forget that until the First World War, the pound was the dominant currency in the world. In 10 years, the dollar took over and became the dominant currency and uh, 
the pound is one of many reserve currencies now. We don't want to run the risk. This is not a risk that a large jurisdiction like the euro area, a large jurisdiction like others that you know very well should take. We should really avoid this. But sorry, I, sh I should not have entered into this. I'm, I'm the, the moderator. So let me uh, once uh, again uh, thank um, the panelists and the audience for uh, very uh, insightful comments and questions. And thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you, Fabio, for doing such an excellent job of chairing what is our final panel of today. Um, I think ahead of lunch, we've heard an awful lot of stimulating ideas about how central banks can stop fintech eating their lunch. We heard about the importance of putting the use case and principles ahead of tech. And among those principles that I took away from the session were that CBDCs must be trustworthy, inclusive, private, and competitive. So please join us tomorrow here in the room or online at 8.45 a.m. We'll also be finding out the winner of our Young Economist Prize, as well as having several more sessions and panels. For those of you here, enjoy your afternoon in Sintra. For those of you online, enjoy your day wherever you may be. Goodbye.